All right, welcome everybody. Good morning. It is uh, a little earlier than, for me than some of you all, I think. Uh, my name is Kira and I'm coming to you from East Oakland, California. So bright and early for me, but I made it to morning coffee and I think some of you I saw there too, which is great. Hi, Nathania. Um, so welcome everyone. I'm going to be talking about some knitting and crochet patterns and kits and specifically this morning I'm talking about texture, uh, which is uh, something that I really love doing as a designer. I design knit and crochet patterns and also some hybrid crochet and a few designs and I'll show some of those that have knitting and crochet elements, generally knitting with a crochet edge because crochet is really good at edgings. Um, I am happy to have this be a little bit more of a conversation than a presentation. So uh, if you have questions, you're welcome to unmute yourself. You're welcome to put them into the chat, which I have open. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. First up, I'm just going to put into the chat my website <laughs> so you know where to find me. I'm lucky enough that I have an unusual name. So if you just Google Kira Knitting or Kira Crochet, you'll find me pretty fast. Um, and then I also want to make sure to let you know, and I'll put this into the chat as well, that I set up a discount code to give you free shipping on any kits through uh, the end of the day this Friday. And I have a vacation coming up, so if you order by Friday, you'll definitely get out before I uh, leave town. <laughs> So um, welcome, I'm just gonna go through a bunch of things. I've got two cameras set up so I can hold things up here or try them on and I can also put them down for a close up view so you can really see the texture. And I'm gonna start just by talking about what I'm wearing today. Uh, this is, and I will get on my tippy toes so you can see more of it. Um, this is called the Essential Cropped Cardigan. It is a short cardigan. I have a longer version as well that I'll show you. Um, and this is a really fun one for texture. So it's done in a double moss stitch, which is one of my favorite patterns. It's a knit pearl pattern that gives you a look almost a little bit reminiscent of weaving as well as knitting. You get a little bit of an under over sort of a feel to it. And then I've also got a cable here that's a ribbed cable. Um, so it's reversible if it happens to flip to the other side. Um, it looks pretty much the same. And there's no uh, seam allowance or anything here because the cabled band is done at the same time as the rest of it. And this is just a real simple um, raglan sweater. And actually I'm gonna take that back. It's not as simple as some of them are because I uh, I do my raglan shaping a little differently on the body in the sleeve so it fits really well. I find that a lot of raglans have very, very simple shaping that doesn't necessarily work well on female bodies. Um, so you end up with baggy sleeves. So it's a slightly complicated raglan shaping, but I do have charts for every size to make that pretty easy. And I'm going to, uh, slide it off here and put it under the other camera so you can see this texture a bit more. And this again, it's called the Essential Cropped Cardigan. I also have one that's called the Essential Cardigan, um, which is a long sleeve, long body version of it. So you can see here it has some really lovely texture, the all over texture of the double moss stitch. And then there's also um, this texture here of the ribbed cable. Uh, so for most of it, you're basically doing a knit one, purl one, and what you do on each row shifts a little bit, but it's pretty easy to track once you get going in my experience. And that one was designed to have very minimal finishing. There's just a little bit of a seam at the back of the neck and a little bit of grafting at the back of the neck and seam at the underarms, but it's pretty, pretty small amount of finishing. So when you're done, you're done, which is um, how I like to do my projects um, when possible. And then I guess I should show you the related version of that. This is called the Essential Cardigan. This is one that's been around for a while and the crop version is newer. And um, this has the same basic idea, same textured body, cable band. We've got a long sleeve and we've got a long body. And I built into my sweaters generally some waist shaping, knowing that if you don't want waist shaping, if you want it just straight, that's really easy for you to make the adjustment. But if you want the waist shaping, I have it on there. And both of these come in a really wide size range. I'm currently working on updating my older patterns to expand the sizes. And I'm often doing a spin-off pattern like this. And oh, wow, this is a red. It does not show like that on screen, but you can at least see the texture there. So again, the double moss stitch and then the cabled band. It's interesting how some colors just don't show up very well on camera. Um, this is like a rich, rich cranberry red. I'm going to kind of intersperse some sweaters and some accessories because I know some people like one and some people like the other. A lot of the accessories I do have available as kits on my online shop, so you can get them in the same yarn that I've got as well. 
So I will pull out one of those next. This is a collar, kind of just pops on. Nice and cozy. And I've got some really cute buttons on here too. So the buttons add a little extra texture. Um, these are from Wooly Moss Roots, who I met at Zenders at Stitches West years ago, and now they've turned into friends. And um, this one is done in hybrid crochet, which is also called Tunisian crochet. It's the full stitch specifically, and it's a really lovely texture. Um, the technique, it's done with a longer hook, although this is short enough, you could do a regular hook with a rubber band as a stopper on the end. And you're doing two passes with every row where you pick up loops on a forward pass and then work them off on the return pass. And it gives you this really thick, squishy fabric. And this particular stitch is one of the thickest and squishiest, which is really, really nice for something like neckwear because um, you're not worried about extra weight. You're not worried so much about draping, but it gives you this great texture. Oh my gosh, my camera is being really wacky. That's so weird. Okay, I'm gonna see if I can figure out what's going on with that. I'm going to um, unplug it and plug it back in because that tends to fix a whole lot of things. Fascinating that it worked for the first thing and not after that. Let's give that another try. There we go. I am always shocked that it works as well as it does to turn it off and on again. So this again is um, this really thick squishy texture. It's a great introduction to hybrid crochet if you've never done it. It's a simple enough stitch. And then the buttons add a lot of interest. And this one I do have available in kits where you get the pattern as well as the yarn. This is Sincere Sheep. And um, this is a an undyed color, but the other colors I have are all naturally dyed. And then the buttons are in there as well. And the kit specifies the kind of wood that's used in the buttons, but they're all this sort of branch slice button. So you get a really nice texture. And I did um, put into the pattern buttonholes because I want people to know how to make them. You don't really have to unbutton it to take them on and off. So if you want to simplify your life even more, you can skip the part with the buttonholes and just sew your buttons straight through both layers of the fabric. And that one is called the Interlocking Tiles Collar. And again, the, um, the texture on this is just really, really squishy and pleasing. Um, I find it really fun to work with. And the other colors have a little bit of variation, which is kind of interesting because you'll see the stitches will sort of change a little bit, um, but still in a very tonal kind of highlight and shadow sort of a way. So that one again is called the Interlocking Tiles Collar. I'm end up with a big stack of stuff behind me because um, I've got a lot to show you today. And again, if anyone has questions, feel free to um, either unmute and get recorded if you wanna do that or put it into the chat, which I have open. I set up the code um, S-E-A-H, so standing for Stitches Expo at Home, July to do free shipping through the end of the week. Um, and I'm showing things that are all available as patterns. I'll let you know if it's available as a kit as well, but even if it's in a kit, you can get just the pattern if you already have some yarn or wanna spin your own. So this next one is really fun. This is a hat, it's called the Bramble Hat. And um, it's got this really lovely bumpy texture. This particular one is a slouchy version, so it's got a little extra. Um, it's one size bigger than I usually wear, so it's a little bit big on me. Um, and it is also available in a beanie, and the hat pattern goes down to kid sizes as well as up through large adult sizes. And the really cool thing about this one is it's reversible. Um, you knit it inside out, because I'm pretty sure you'd rather knit than purl. Most people do. Um, and then when it's done, this is generally considered the right side of the stitch pattern, but I quite like the wrong side too. You get this um, bit of a texture and almost a very slightly lacy effect. So you get two hats in one. And when I'm wearing it and talking to people and I tell them it's reversible, I just am in the habit, I take it off, I turn it the other way, and then I put it back on that way until the next time somebody asks me about it. And then I keep doing that. So it flips um, all through the day, especially if I'm a vendor at Stitches or somewhere and talking to knitters and crocheters all day long. So you can see here, this is the um, the bumpy kind of outside, what's usually considered outside. So these are little nubbins um, and a dark purple. It almost looks a bit like a black raspberry. And then on the other side of the fabric, you get this sort of like a, a geometric pattern um, with just a little bit of lace openings. You can see a little bit of my skin in here popping through. Um, and it's got a really nice drape as well. And that's a fun texture. It's done through increases and decreases. So when you increase, you start creating a bump. And when you decrease, that um, finishes it up. So the increase followed by the decrease on the next 
two rows. Um, creates this little bumpy texture that's really fun and not that hard to do. I have to say too, I, um, I've been knitting for almost 40 years now. I've been teaching for 20, designing for 15. I haven't found anything in the realm of knitting or crochet that's really super, super hard to do. There's a lot that's not intuitive. There's some things I don't enjoy, but um, the act of doing them isn't that hard. So if there's anything that's been kind of making you nervous to try, give it a try. It's uh, There's a lot out there and um, some things you get a lot of impact for not a whole bunch of extra effort. So I'll show you one of those next. Welcome new folks. Um, I'm just gonna put my website into the chat again. And then I also have a discount code uh, for my kits. If you use the code S-E-A-H July, so it stands for Stitches at Home, sorry, Stitches Expo at Home July, that'll give you free shipping on kits good through the end of the day this Friday. So next up, I've got a um, fun little uh, baby design, just kind of baby into kids. And it is a dress and it's got this really lovely texture at the top. Uh, it's on both sides here. Um, and this is done through a slip stitch pattern. And here you're getting both the texture and color because I worked it in stripes. I'll show you this stitch and a couple other designs later on because it's one um, that I really love working with. Um, basically you're slipping every other stitch on every other row. It is uh, often called linen stitch, sometimes called tweed stitch, especially if it's worked in two colors like this. Um, and it's really not that hard. It feels feels a little bit like a knit one, purl one, except you're not purling, you're slipping the stitches. Um, so it's faster. And uh, when you work it in two colors like this, you get this really cute, tiny little chevron. And it also gives you a firmer fabric because you're slipping the stitches. So you can see here, the bottom of the skirt portion here is done in stockinette. And there's a very slight gather. This is the same number of stitches, but the um, stockinette is a little bit more expansive whereas the tweed stitch here pulls in. So you get a little bit of shaping for free, no extra effort other than changing. And then I also have here, this is a design that has a little bit of crochet mixed in with the knitting. This is a little um, lace crochet edge. So I'm gonna switch over to my other camera and give you a close up of both of those. So here is the linen stitch, let me flip it over a tweed stitch pattern. So again, this is real simple. You're only working one color at a time. It's a slip stitch pattern. So you're basically working two row stripes. So two row of your light color, two row of your dark color. But sometimes instead of knitting or purling, you're slipping a stitch and that brings up the other color and you get this really lovely um, tiny little chevron pattern without having to hold two strands of yarn at once. And then you can see here too how there's this very slight um, size change creating little gathers as it heads into the stockinette portion and that lets the skirt be a little bit wider. Um, there are some increases in that as well. And then at the bottom, when you're done with the knitting, there is this very small crochet edge. I really like a crochet edge on knit because it can give you a smooth edge. And of course, lace details are uh, always fun. We'll be back later today talking about lace. And here, um, it's pretty simple crochet. If you've done a basic single crochet edging, this is a nice next step. And I have the instructions both written and charted and crochet stitch diagrams are really lovely because they look like what they are. And then up here at the bodice, there is a crochet edge on the armhole and the neckline. And that just gives it a really nice finish without having to have a big thick rib or something else in knitting. You can have a much narrower edging and crochet just to do a clean finish, which is something that I always like playing with. And as somebody who does a lot of knitting and a lot of crochet, Sometimes it's sort of fun to, to tempt people into doing whichever one they don't do as much or haven't tried before. Um, it's, it's not too tricky to do a simple crochet edge and I think it's a lovely finish for knitting. And then maybe I'll talk you into crocheting a hat and then maybe I'll crochet a shawl and we'll kind of get you into doing all the crafts, which is what I always like to do. All right, so let's see, what have I got here next? So well, this is kind of a fun one. Um, Let's talk about some cables. Cables are a great way to do texture. So I seem to only have one of these mitts with me, but it is a really fun one. And this is a pattern, uh, it's called the Ba Relief Mitts. Oh, I forgot to tell you the name of the little dress I just had. That's called the Moppet Sundress. So this is called the Ba Relief Mitts. There is a coordinating hat and cowl. I don't think they made it into my stack today, but if they're buried, I'll pull them out when I get to it. 
Um, and this is a really fun pattern using cables. And these are often called traveling stitches, where it's just a single knit stitch traveling across a background of purl stitches. I really love them because they are less thick than traditional cables where you're folding over more stitches into a thicker fabric. So this gives you um, bas relief as an art term for low relief, like a carving where you don't carve very deep. So it doesn't stick out as much, but it sticks out plenty to see it. Uh, I also really like them in terms of the action of doing it because you are only ever crossing two stitches. And in this case, you're only ever crossing a knit in front of a purl. So you can tell really quickly whether it goes to the front or back because the knit is always going to be cabling to the front in the foreground. And um, you can do it without a cable needle. So very easily, no stitches coming off the needles, nothing sort of in danger. You just work the second stitch before you work the first stitch and then they both come off. And in my instructions, I have the um, option. So I give you the instructions for doing it with a cable needle and for doing it without. If you're brand new to cables, this style is a great way to start. And you might wanna try it with a cable needle a few times just to get the idea of what's happening and why. And then try it without a cable needle because that's gonna be a whole lot faster. So let me get this under my close-up camera. There we go, I'll keep it on my hand because it kind of stretches it out. So you can see here, um, this is a really graphic design and it's how I tend to like doing my designs where you can tell what you should do next. These are going outwards till they bump into their neighbors and then they come inwards till they bump in and outwards again. So after a little while, I find that I can follow patterns like this without having to count my rows. And then I've got some increases in here to create the thumb gusset so it fits really nicely. Um, I definitely prefer to do a gusset in most of my glove patterns so that there's room for this base of your thumb. So that's a really fun one. They're called again the ba relief mittens and ba is a French word, it's spelled B-A-S. So um, I do sometimes hear people calling them bas relief because that's how you might read it if you uh, don't know the term. Excuse me, I had a little frog in my throat. Um, so those ones I do have available as a kit and the kit lets you do the hat and the matching mittens. I don't seem to have a hat at hand here, but it's one that also comes in child to adult sizes and has um, both a beanie version and a slouchy version. And there's enough in the kit that you could do the slouchy version with the mitts if you wanted to. All right, let's, let's keep talking about cables for a little while. Cables are a really fun way to do texture and you get a lot of impact for not a whole lot of extra work, um, especially with cables. Let's see which one do I wanna show you here. Yeah, let's do this guy. Especially with cables like this, where they're sort of a smaller part of the project. So I can't put this on, it's a little kid's vest. Uh, there is a long sleeve version as well. Um, it's called the Organic Hoodie. And um, this one is kind of fun because it's not a whole lot of cables. So there's this one big cable up the back that goes through the entire hood. So it reminds me almost like a, a dorsal ridge on a, a lizard or dragon. Um, and it's uh, what we call a staghorn cable. So you can see they're kind of going out like little antlers and then another one and another one stacked up. Um, they're really fun to do. If you're new to cables, it's a nice one because you get to cable both to the back and to the front since we have some of these that are heading to the left and some that are heading to the right. Uh, and most of it, is just reverse stockinette. So you're only doing the cables occasionally, but you get a lot of impact for it. And this one for the kids version, I also have those two cables heading up the front. Um, I've got a ribbed band on the front, which is knit at the same time. You don't have to apply it. So this is pretty minimal finishing. I have a three needle bind off for the shoulder and just a little seam for part of the collar. So just kind of from the back here to the front band, those are the only seams that you need to do for the vest version. And there is a long sleeve version for this as well. It's all in the same pattern. So you've got options on sizing as well as sleeves or no sleeves. I think the vests are really great because when kids grow out of things, it's generally gonna be in the limbs. So in the arms and legs grow out. So a vest can last a whole lot longer. This is a two year size. Um, it's pretty generous two year size. And I've had it on a five year old um, because they really wanted to try it on. And because it's got a roomy enough armhole and we weren't worried about sleeve length, totally fit. Actually, that five-year-old's name was Kira, like me too, which is sort of fun. So this is called the organic hoodie. I'm gonna put it under the close-up camera so you can really see these nice textured cables. Um, this particular version is a slightly thick and thin cotton yarn. So you're adding a little extra texture from that. 
Um, I'll show you a version, an adult version inspired by this that has a smoother yarn as well. So this one, um, I don't do kits for garments just because there's a lot of variety in terms of yarn amounts for sizing, but I do have the pattern available. I'll put the link to my website in the chat once more because I can see some new folks are here. All my patterns are available there. They're also on Love Crafts and they're also on Ravelry. So whichever one that you like, it's available. Let's just stick with this close-up camera for a minute. And I'm gonna show you a variation on that pattern. So the organic hoodie is a kid's pattern. And um, a lot of adults said, hey, I want one like that. And so I ended up coming up with a pattern that is not the same, but it sort of plays on the similar idea. So we have here, this is on the back, another staghorn cable. Because it's an adult size, it is bigger. So I made a wider cable, um, but it's the same basic idea as that. And this one, again, just like the other goes up, up over the hood. So this cable is going on the back of the sweater. So this is the back and it goes up through the hood all the way to the top. So again, kind of like a little dorsal ridge that you see on lizards these days, dinosaurs back in the day, dragons, if you like fantasy. <laughs> and this one I did a little bit different than the kids one. So it's still their stockinette. Um, I do, did a long sleeve version. I made it a raglan shoulder rather than a drop shoulder because I find that um, is a bit more flattering because uh, it fits a little bit more. And rather than those big cables going up the front, instead I did little cables along the pockets. And uh, I'm a big fan of pockets in general. You always have need to have a place to put your stuff. Um, so this way I get the cable detail in the front, but it's not a big thick band running right over the chest line. Um, the pockets aren't too tricky to do. I will say they don't make sense at the beginning, but if you do what it says in the order, it says they absolutely work. Uh, whenever I get emailed questions about this pattern, people say I don't get the pockets. They have not yet cast on and they are not at the point where they're ready to do the pockets. They're just reading in advance and trying to understand it all at the beginning. And I've heard that advice being given and I don't know that it's the best advice. <laughs> if you know you have a quality pattern and you do each thing in order and you understand how step one goes, you do step one, you understand step two, do step two, it should work out just fine. But especially with something like this that's three dimensional where we've got multiple layers of fabric happening at the same time, um, it can be hard to understand that before you've done it. But you might be able to do one and then read it and understand how it works and why it works. So this is called the grown up hoodie. And again, it's related to that kids one, the organic hoodie. By popular demand, a lot of adults wanted their own version of that. Um, and that's the one that I do want to return to soon and add another couple of sizes. Generally, my sweater patterns go up to around a 54 or 55 inch chest. And I'm expanding that to go up to, you know, 60 plus whatever the recommended ease is. But as I'm doing that, I'm going through them making new samples, sometimes making a spin-off version. I would love a crop version of that for me. So I think that might be in the works. And also adding things like some helpful videos and extra charts for things like the raglan shaping. Um, so I'm doing it a little slowly so I can actually spend a lot of time and um, improve the pattern in multiple ways in addition to expanding the sizes. All right, so let's see. If anyone has questions, please feel free to jump in. Um, I'm happy to, to chat with you rather than just showing stuff. But um, if not, I will just keep talking and showing things. I've been designing for 15 years. I've got, I think it's close to 120 patterns. Um, so there's a lot to talk about. <laughs> and texture is something that I really enjoy playing with. This next one though, I'm gonna show it this afternoon as well when I talk about lace, because it brings in both elements. Um, this is called the switchback cowl. And you can see here, it's got lace, there's holes on purpose. But there's also this really lovely texture line that happens based on the decreases. And that makes the pattern look like it's shifting a little bit to the right and a little bit to the left. It reminds um, people sometimes a little bit of entrelock um, because you get that directional shift of the stitches. And the way you get that on here is that lace is always made out of increases and decreases. And generally the increases are going to be done with yarn overs. And the decreases um, can be done in a variety of ways. Often they're right next to each other. So things like a yarn over and a knit two together. And here, and actually let me turn this right side up. Here I've got the increases, the yarn overs are spaced a little bit away from the matching decreases. 
And that's what makes all these stitches look like they're leaning that way. And then these stitches look like they're leaning this way. It actually does make them actually lean that way. So this is called the switchback cowl. It is super fun to knit. And I know it looks complicated, but when I'm following it, I keep an eye that this decrease line stays connected. And that lets me know where I am and that things are working. Uh, and this one I do have available in kits with an alpaca yarn. It's um, from a small farm alpaca ranch near me in California. Um, and it's really just super, super soft. It's the best quality small farm alpaca that I've ever seen. So I've got a message in the chat. Janet's wondering if the adult hooded sweater could be done without the hood. Yeah, that'd be really easy. So this is done seamlessly from the bottom up. So the hood is the last thing you do. Um, and what you would wanna do is when you get up here where it starts telling you to keep going for the back of the hood, you would instead, um, you could bind those stitches off or just keep them and pick up along the edge. And I would probably work a little bit of this knit two purl two rib to match what's happening for the rest of the sweater. And you could just keep it as a little short rib to close in and be like a crew neck, or you could even go farther and have it be a fold over collar if you wanted to. But um, since it's the final thing you do, it's an easy place to adapt it. And I think, I think I've seen somebody do it as a crew neck. Um, I can't remember if it was Instagram. It's long enough ago, I think it might be on Ravelry. So if you can use Ravelry, take a look at the grown up hoodie and then the projects tab. And I'm pretty sure there's at least one in there that's done that. And that's actually good for me to know you're curious because again, I'm gonna be revamping the pattern and that could be an easy uh, adjustment to make. Although I don't know if I can call it the grown up hoodie if it doesn't have a hood. <laughs> but maybe I'll, maybe I'll, I'll uh, make myself a, self a second crop version without that on there. So um, let's chat about some more accessories. What have I got here? Let's stay in the world of cables for a little bit longer because I've got a few more options in cables. Um, this is one that I really just love the stitch pattern on. Um, it's super fun to do. It's a little bit more complex as a cable for sure. Uh, we've got a lot of those traveling stitches that I mentioned before where one knit stitch sort of travels across a background of purl stitch. Really easy to do without a cable needle. And then you can see in the center of these motifs, there's one big cable before it spreads out and do the next one. This is called the interlaced cowl. Uh, and I enjoyed making this so much that when I was done with a sample of the cowl, I had a little yarn left over and then I just had to design some mitts that go with it. So uh, these, um, it's just this pattern, but on a smaller scale. And it's interesting because they almost end up looking like a spider because <laughs> you've got the four, four legs on each side and little body in the middle. Um, and for this one, I do have kits. It's a naturally dyed yarn from Sincere Sheep, and the kits come with enough yarn for you to do both the cowl and the mitts. So this is kind of a nice cozy one. It's not chokingly close because I don't like that, but it is close enough that it can definitely keep you warm. And depending on how you want to wear it, you can kind of fold it in or um, even wrap it a bit and button up a coat if you're in a really cold, windy place. So you can do that to make sure the wind doesn't get through. So I'm gonna put this under the close-up camera so you can see the texture. I chose here a nice round yarn. So you get a lot of um, kind of difference between the pearl background sort of sinks in and the knit stitches pop up. And again, it's a little bit more complicated as a cable. If you're nervous, you can always do the mitts first because they are less complex, but get you to a similar place. Um, I do have on my patterns, the instructions are both written out and charted. And the chart's gonna be a nice way to get to visualize what's supposed to be happening. Another recommendation that I have whenever you have a more complicated pattern that you're feeling a little nervous about tracking is to use markers. So as you're casting on or as you do your first pattern row, you can put in a marker after every pattern repeat or maybe every other pattern repeat. And then um, as you are knitting, you'll get to the asterisk, the repeat on your pattern and you'll get to your marker and your knitting you can go, okay, good, that part worked. And then you do your next repeat, you hit your next marker and you say, okay, good, that part worked. And if sometimes you get to the asterisk and you're not at the marker, you know something's wrong, you know it right away and you know it's in that section right there, as opposed to following the whole round, worried the whole time and realizing that you're one stitch off at the very, very end. It could be that as you keep practicing the pattern and your piece grows, you get to where you can see how things are supposed to land and you may take those markers out 
but at the beginning they're super helpful just to keep track. And then again, this is one, it's a kind of pattern I like, it's very geometric because I prefer to follow it by eye. So you can see here, these stitches sort of branch outwards from where they had been till they meet and then they hang out and then eventually they're gonna come out again. So it's a pattern that you can see pretty clearly as you are knitting it. Not, uh, pattern recognition is not everybody's strong suit. So if you're not seeing that, use the markers. They can help you a lot as you get going. And that one again, it's called the Interlaced Cowl and Mitts. And I do have some kits for that as well. Um, I've also got another glove here that uses those traveling stitches, which again, two stitch cables where a knit crosses in front of a purl. And these have actual cables as well too, where knits are crossing in front of knits. Uh, these are called the reticulated mitts. They are a favorite of mine. Um, they're really nice if you're doing gifts because first of all, they're impressive. <laughs> um, they're also kind of fun for you to make. It's not super boring to make, but because of this pattern, they're really stretchy. So sizing, they fit almost everybody. I've got multiple sizes in the pattern. Everyone wants to try these on when I've got them in a booth at an event like Stitches. Um, the only thing is sometimes people think that the thumb's a little small because they're grabbing a small size, but the hand expands to fit. And so then I just tell them they want to make the medium or large size so that they have a bit more room in the thumb. Um, and let me put these under the close-up camera. Yeah, so this is um, just a really fun pattern to do. It's another geometric one. You kind of see how things go out. We've got two twists here before they start heading out again. Um, I really enjoy making that and I really love the look of it as well. And that one's called the reticulated mitts. I have some kits for this in this yarn, which is a naturally dyed yarn. Um, so I've got some really beautiful colors that are rich. I used to think natural dyes were sort of pastel. And then I met some natural dyers and found out I was wrong. So this one, let me see, there we go. So, um, so this is another cabled mitt. It's called the mandala mitts. And that's because there's a matching mandala hat that has um, this cable pattern all over and a really beautiful decrease at the top. And these ones are um, not the traveling stitches. These are more traditional cables, but we do still have knits going over a background of pearls and sometimes crossing in a lattice pattern, um, which is fun to do. This is one you could do with or without a cable needle, depending on your preference. And the matching hat is really um, lovely. I don't think it made it to my table. Sorry, I have a lot of samples. I grabbed a ton of them and it looks like I missed a few. Um, but it's a really fun hat pattern. It's got some little buttons on the side too, which are included in the kit. And that again is called the mandala mitts or mandala hat is the matching hat. Um, in case anyone's new, I'm going to go ahead and just put my website back into the chat. And if you're interested in kits through the end of the day on Friday, I am offering free shipping. And the code for that is S-E-A-H July. Are standing for Stitches Expo at Home, which is the event we're at July. Um, and I always do free shipping for anyone who's ordering at least $100 worth of kits. And I should specify free shipping within the U.S. Can't afford to do that everywhere in the world, unfortunately, but I can ship internationally. So next up, um, we're gonna shift away from cables and get into some slip stitch texture, which is one of my favorite ways to do texture and um, definitely my favorite way to do color work. Slip stitch, if you haven't tried it before, is a style of knitting where you have some stitches that are knit or purled and some that you slip, which just moves the stitch up um, and in this case, it moves the color up to the next row. So here I'm not working with two colors at once. I'm not trying to strand it. They, um, you can do that, but this is easier. Instead, I'm basically working with stripes and sometimes I pull up one of the other colors. So you do get some texture here in the garter stitch, uh, especially with this slightly striated naturally dyed yarn. Um, but the real fun in the texture here is this, and you can do slip stitch just for texture or you can do it for texture and color, which is what I've done here. This is called the cellular shawlette. This is the shawlette size. There is a shawl size as well. This is a good one to, um, if you like doing this like I do and kind of wrapping your shawls around your neck, it's a nice size for that. It can also fit around your shoulders or if you really like to be enveloped, um, you can go with a larger shawl size, but this is plenty just for, you know, a little, you can tie it or pin it or just throw it over. And I'm going to put this underneath the close-up camera. 
I have the close-up camera mostly for when I'm teaching, but it's really lovely for this too, so you can see the stitches a bit more um, precisely. So here we've got our slip stitch pattern, and then there's a little garter stitch edge here. It's interesting to see how the camera's reacting to all these different colors. It's blowing out a little bit on this turquoise, but you can at least see the texture of the stitches. So that one again is called the cellular chalet because um, this pattern really reminds me of kind of cell structures that you see in a lot of things in nature, like honeycombs and turtle shells. And let's see, I wanna make sure to show you some more crochet. I've got a lot of crochet coming up in my afternoon talk about lace. So let's talk about a little crochet. This is actually lace and texture. So I'll show it twice today. Um, this is called the Wind and Sea Shawl and it uses both um, color and texture and lace, so I guess a trio. There we go, I'm right just the light there. Um, it is another one that's hybrid crochet, also called Tunisian crochet, where you've got a long hook and you're picking up lots of loops on a forward pass and then crocheting them off in a return pass. And here you can see just the texture in a single color. Um, it's a really fun one, not too tricky to do a good intro. Um, for somebody who is adventurous, or if you've done a little bit of the hybrid crochet, it's a nice skill builder. Um, and this also has a little texture in the form of this edging, which is just the ends of the rows and the way that I've worked the increases there. So that one's called the Wind and Sea Shawl. I've got kits of it. I'm almost out of these kits and the dyer isn't doing the same style of yarn, so I'm gonna have to figure out a new plan. Um, this is the larger of two sizes and that's what the kit is for. So it is a nice kind of big one. It is oh, somewhere a little over 60 inches long. So it's a good one if you do like to wrap up. And it is an asymmetric triangle. You can see one ends longer than the other. Um, and because it's got those open sections, it is absolutely squishable to just do a big wrap if you like wearing things like that instead. So I've got the chat open if anyone has questions or if you wanna um, unmute, you're also welcome to do that. Make sure to put this in my pile for my afternoon presentation on lace because I'll be showing that one again. And let's talk about a little bit more texture. This is a really- When is your afternoon session? Yeah, sure. When is your afternoon session? Oh, uh, that is going to be, let me see. It is at three central, which is one o'clock for me in California. I live in Central, so it's easy for me. <laughs> oh, that's nice. Yeah, occasionally I'll do the time change backwards and <laughs> make a mistake. But yeah, I'm doing it at uh, three o'clock Central and I'll be talking all about lace. And I've got an even bigger stack of lace projects than I do of the texture projects I've been showing here. And for anyone who can't make it, it'll be recorded. So you can see it um, through the Stitches dashboard or I'll be putting this on my YouTube channel as well. So next up, I wanna talk to you about this big giant cowl. Um, this is called the overlay cowl and it is, I usually wear it double, you can definitely triple it. Um, it's really fun because it's got this lovely texture, which is slip stitch. So only one color is being worked at a time. You're basically knitting stripes and sometimes you're slipping a stitch, which is how you pull up the other color. So that's a little added texture. You can see these are, um, pearl ridges. So they stick out from the fabric and I, um, made a very specific yarn choice for this. My background yarn is a gradient alpaca, which is a little bit of a, a flatter yarn. It really does sort of flatten out. And then for the yarn that's on top, this is called the overlay cowl. It's knitted at once, but it looks like it's just laying on top. Um, I chose a really round sort of sock style yarn that has some silk in it. So because the round texture and the shine of the silk, it really sort of sticks out both physically and visually. So um, you see it quite well, even here where the colors are not as far apart or some places where the value is not as far apart, it still shows really nicely because of that texture. And this one, it's called the overlay cowl. It was very, very, very long <laughs> to use all of that beautiful gradient. This particular one is the vineyard colorway and you can see it just sort of gradually transitions. It was inspired by all the colors of a, um, vineyard throughout the seasons. And I'll put that under the close up video. Make sure I get it with the right side up. 
Yeah, so here are two of the colors that you can see next to each other. This one is knit in a tube and then grafted at the end, so it's a nice seamless finish. And um, I promise the slip stitch knitting is really not very hard. This also has a little cable, so these two slip stitches were next to each other, and then they do a very small two stitch cable outwards so that you get this opening. Um, it's a really kind of pleasing pattern to knit. And really fun to see the colors change too. I always get really excited um, when I'm working with a gradient yarn because I just want to get to the next color. And I do, and that's so fun that I want to get to the next color. So um, it goes a little faster than you might expect for something with a lot of yards. <laughs> All right, let's see. Here's a nice simple one. So this is called the seated rib hat. Um, it's a really good basic hat, especially if you need to do some presents for people. Having the Oliver rib that makes it extra stretchy, especially in a wool yarn like this. Uh, this yarn was from Oink Pigments. Uh, I'm out of kits for this, but I might restock it at some point. The pattern's available. It comes from baby sizes up to adult sizes. It's really adaptable. And there is both a, um, this is the beanie style, but there's also a slouchy style too that comes out a little longer, which is what my personal version of it that I tend to wear is. Um, it's a real simple knit and purl pattern, not too hard to do. And then um, decreases really neatly in at the top. My personal philosophy on hat decreases is that they need to look nice. So either, either you get something that sort of flows from the pattern and lines up really nicely, or as the bramble hat from earlier, you don't really see the decreases at all. Those are the two ways I like to do hats as opposed to have something different there or having it be a little bit messy. So here this one is in the close-up. So real simple pattern of knits and purls. Um, it is a little more interesting than a basic knit one purl one rib and a little easier to do because some rounds you're just knitting. Uh, so uh, fun and easy. It's a really great one if you want to do a lot of hats for presents, especially for people who like to wear very simple things. Got another fun hat here. I'll show it on as well. So this is a slip stitch pattern again, where you can see these stitches are slipped and that's what makes them tall. It also blends the colors in a really unusual way. Um, it's another one where the decreases just make sense for the hat, where each of those sort of the space in between disappears till we get down to the very, very top. Um, this is called the grid work slouch. It's a slouchy hat by design, but it would be easy to make it a little shorter for a beanie. And it comes with a coordinating cowl. And the cowl is really fun because this has three different colors. So you can see here, I've got the dark green and the purple and then the light green. And as you're knitting along, you switch one at a time. So the dark green is in the foreground. So I switch from the purple to the light green for the background. Then continue along here, same two colors. These are my two greens, but you switch which one's in the front. And then as you keep going, you end up switching which one's in the back. And you sort of keep doing that as you go through. So the next step, you would switch same two colors, but you switch which one's in the front. And then as you continue, you will switch which one's in the back. Um, so with three colors of yarn, you get six sections of the fabric. Uh, I have specific lengths written in the pattern, but you can also just sort of play that by ear or do it when you feel like it. Um, and I really love this set because the yarn is four mini skeins, three solids, and one variegated that uses those colors from the solids. And I really like it because it is obviously a set, right? Like you can tell those go together, but they're not matchy matchy. It's not the exact same fabric on the hat and the cowl. Same stitch, but it looks different in the variegated. And you're not doing the same color blocking effect, which would be a little harder to do on a small scale like a hat. So that one again is called the Grid Work Cowl and Slouch. The yarn is from Wonderland Dye Works, and it comes with a set of the three minis and the variegated. And then you also get the choice to use your favorite of the solids for the band of the hat, which is nice because that's the one that's going to frame your face. So like for me, the bright green, I probably wouldn't have done, but either the dark green or purple, I like on myself. Yeah, so Margo said that they like the hidden decreases or adding them into the pattern. Yeah, I, uh, I, I think it's a fun challenge as a designer to make a nice neat hat top and there's different ways you can do it, whether it's just almost invisible or if it adds on to the design element. So I tend to do one or the other. <clears throat> and generally I will, if it's a nice top, I will have a shot of that in the pattern so you can see it. Excuse me, just one moment. Okay. 
Thank you. I taught three sessions of classes yesterday, so <laughs> my voice is a little bit tired. Um, let's see, we've got a bit more time. I've got a couple more things to show you. Uh, let's do another one that's got some texture and some lace because I think lace is a texture. I'm gonna talk a lot more about texture in my second session coming up today. But this is a fun one where I've got some lace and texture, both texture and the lace and a different texture at the top. This is called the River Bend Shawl. There's a shawlette size as well. And you can see I used a gradient yarn. And the lace has this little texture line that goes through it. These are the decreases. And it's similar to one I showed earlier where the decreases are not right next to the yarn over their offset. So then the fabric in between, the stitches in between have this little lean going on, which is really fun. This particular one, um, it is a finer yarn. It's a fingering weight yarn. It's a lot of stitches because you cast on at the bottom, but I set it up so that there's no shaping in the lace. You just keep your same number of stitches and you're basically making a rectangle with the lace. And then you end up at the top and here you're shifting into a slip stitch pattern, which naturally draws it in to start with. And there's some short rows up here in the slip stitch. And if you're scared of short rows, this is a really good introduction. Because of the slip stitch pattern, you do not have to do wrap and turns for your short rows, you just turn it. So you get the idea of short rows without the stuff that people tend to find tricky of making the wraps and hiding the wraps. Um, I'm gonna pop this under here. It's actually one of, one of my favorite tricks is to hide short rows within a slip stitch pattern because of that. So here you can see the lace patterning and there's this little texture line down the center of the solid sections. Those are the decreases to pair with the yarn overs. And you can see it looks a lot like the stitches are sort of angled in or angled out because of that. So you get a lot going on in the solid section. And then up here, this is our slip stitch pattern, which pulls it in and hides all the short rows. So you can kind of see little, the little section here where this is shorter. And over here on the other side, it's longer. There are literally more rows here than there. And that uh, is done where you go partway across the row and then turn back. So you go partway here and turn back and a little farther and turn back. And so that means you've got more rows built up here. And this is a really easy way to try short rows if you've been nervous about them, since there is no rapid turn to deal with. And that one again is called the River Bend Shawl. A friend of mine named it after all these kind of twists and turns that are in the lace pattern. All right, my stack is getting smaller. <laughs> um, Oh, here, this is another one of that same kind of slip stitch pattern uh, where you it's got two colors. So like the baby dress that I showed earlier, um, this is Odysseus the Octopus, um, really fun kind of skill builder, great for mini skeins or leftover bits and pieces. Even mismatched buttons are kind of fun for the eyes. So this is a slip stitch pattern. You're making two row stripes, but because you sometimes slip a stitch, it pulls up the color and also gives you this nice texture that feels and looks a lot like a woven fabric. It even sort of pulls in a little bit. So it does have a bit more of that um, sort of halfway between a knit and woven texture. It's not as stretchy. It doesn't matter so much for the octopus, but sometimes that's a useful thing. And the little eye cord stripes for the legs. So he's a really fun one. His name's Odysseus. And I also want to show you um, some times where texture is sort of subtle, but adds to the design. So this particular one, it's called the Prismatic Honeycomb Shawl. I'll pop it on here. Um, the thing you first notice about this is the color, right? It's got all this really exciting color work that's happening. We've got 10 different hexagons. Um, and that's the first thing you're gonna notice, but there's a lot of texture in here as well. So these hexagons are worked from the outside in, and you can see the decreases here create this really lovely spiral. Um, that shows really nicely, even in the variegated colors, you can see it because it sticks out. You've got that texture going on. I also put in a little extra texture in between. So you can see these little ridges. There's one in green and one in the blue, and that highlights the connection. This is all done seamlessly. So you are not sewing them together at the end. You do your first hexagon, and then as you do the second one, it joins onto it. The third one joins onto both of those, and there's a little map in the pattern that shows you where to put them. Um, so this isn't a seam, but it is still a uh, kind of a connection area. And that little ridge 
adds a lot to sort of really set off each hexagon. And then the spiral in there is um, just a really lovely detail. And then as you get into the edging, I'll put this under the other camera too, um, we've got here some increases and decreases that follow the shape of the hexagon. So you've got this sort of a big zigzag edge. Let's see if I can hold it up so you can see just the edge. Yep, so there you've got um, some texture going on with the decreases. A little texture from it being wrinkly, sorry about that. <laughs> It is uh, hard to keep everything pristine when they're packed up a lot of the year. So let me pop one of these under here. So you can see we've got the texture of the spiral decreases. Um, in addition to just seeing the decrease, they do stick out a little bit. And then the texture here where the two colors are joined, these two are even similar colors. So that is um, really helps to delineate it. And then as you get down to the edging, um, again, there's that ridge at the pickup. And then the increases and decreases themselves create a little bit of added texture. So it highlights the shaping of that particular one. And that's called the Prismatic Honeycomb Shawl. I do have kits for it in um, a few different colors. And it has the 10 mini skeins and then one full skein for the etching. And that's from Wonderland Dye Works Yarn, um, who's a uh, somebody I actually met through shows like Stitches West and has turned into a friend of mine. Um, she does really lovely colors. This one is called Lustrous Gems. It is by far the most popular one, but I've also got some other ones. I've got a pastel one. I've got one that's mostly in the blue range. So there are other options if um, the uh, jewel tones are not your tones. Okay, I actually got through my whole stack of things. I do have a few more that I are within reach that I'm gonna be talking about for my lace presentation. And I do wanna just bring in a bit more crochet because I realized I didn't have a ton of crochet for some reason. Um, this is a really fun one in crochet. We've got a lot going on here. <laughs> There's lace and texture and color. I'll put it under the close up in a second. This is called the Channel Islands Cowl. And this is a crocheted lace. It's sort of a meshy lace with these bobbles in the middle. So you get a nice little texture there. Um, I think that crochet is great for lace. It's great for texture. I'm gonna set this on here. So I'm just doing a single layer so you can see it a little more. And actually let me, Turn this right side up. So this would be how it looks to you as you're crocheting it. So here we've got um, the lace openings and we have bobbles in the middle that sort of fill in. We've got open diamonds and here this is a bobble hanging out in a diamond. It kind of flattens out a little bit depending on your yarn, but it gives you a really lovely texture and the difference between the open and the solid areas is really fun. I'm going to grab another one in crochet that's got some bobbles as well. We'll start in the close up for this one. That last one was called the Channel Islands Cowl. And here, this is one that is quite popular for me. It's called the Belle Epoque Shawl. And it is done with this really lovely edging that brings in elements of lace, also some texture. These are bobbles again, and little pico bumps at the very edge. Um, it is not as hard as it looks. It's a, uh, I'd say it's an intermediate or even advanced beginner crochet pattern, especially if you have some help. You start at the top and you are increasing. Every so often you do these eyelet rows for a little bit of openness. And then when you get down to the bottom, you're doing that really beautiful edging. You can do it in one color or add in a second one as shown here. Um, and this is the smaller of two sizes. It fits well around your neck, which is kind of nice because you get all this interest going on here. It also will fit around the shoulders or if you like a big enveloping shawl, the next size up is really, really big <laughs> because it's got a, um, a long repeat for the edging. So it kind of needed to be big to do the next one. Yep, so that brings in um, some of the, the textured bobble stitches as well as the just the idea of texture in lace where you're alternating the open sections and the solid sections. So it's called the Belle Epoque Shawl, and it's a uh, pretty popular one for me. All right, um, it's been an hour. <laughs> Thanks for folks who had questions. Um, if anyone has any other questions, I'm happy to answer them. If not, I just want to remind you that um, my website is kirakdesigns.com. I'll put it into the chat. Uh, if you just Google Kira knitting or Kira crochet, you find me pretty quickly too, which is uh, a little bit lucky, and part of why I put my name into my.
a uh, business name because it's easy to remember. I also act as my own model, which uh, is not my favorite part of the job, but it's really nice in terms of recognition because folks know who I am then when I walked into a show or into a yarn shop. So um, all my patterns are on my website, kirakdesigns.com. They're also on Lovecrafts and they're also on Ravelry. A lot of them are um, on webs, which is yarn.com, but not quite all of them. And there's some other sites out there that have, you know, a selection of ones that tend to match yarns that they carry. I also have on my website kits that pair my knitting and crochet patterns with yarn from indie dyers who I really like working with. They're people who I like them as people. I like their sort of business practices and their ethics, and they have wonderful yarn. And in many cases, my designs start with that yarn. So I will get yarn that, you know, I'm drawn to for the color and texture, and I'll play around swatching to figure out what I can do to make that yarn look as best as it possibly can, uh, you know, in my own opinion, of course. Um, so often the designs sort of spring out from the yarn, and sometimes very, very much so. So like this one, the grid work set, the cowl and slouch, this is a very particular set of yarn with the four mini skeins, four, three solids and a variegated, and I don't think I would have come up with this exact pattern if I didn't have those um, kind of limitations of the yarn. So it can be really fun to have something that feels almost like a collaboration where the dyer comes up with the yarn set and then I have to come up with something that uses it. I really enjoy that sort of a thing of designing with some constraints and then a lot of freedom outside of it. All right, well, thank you everyone for spending some time with me. I'll be back a little later today. If you miss it, it'll be on my YouTube channel. And for those of you watching this in the future in the YouTube channel, thanks for hanging out. If you have questions, you can always email me, kirakdesigns at gmail.com. Um, and if you want to keep in touch on my website, I have an email newsletter. Best way to make sure you're going to hear from me is to sign up for the email list. I also um, am on both Instagram and Facebook as Kirake Designs. So those are other places that you can sort of see what's happening, but you might not get all the messages, the way that those platforms work. So email is definitely the best. And um, yeah, thanks so much for coming. Have a great day, everyone.